Good afternoon and thank you. I'm Mike Farnworth, BC's Solicitor General and Minister of Public Safety. Today I'm joining you from the uh, traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking people and the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. I'm also joined by Minister Adrian Dix, the Minister of Health, as well as Dr. Sarah Henderson from the BC Centre for Disease Control. As we're all aware, a heat warning is in effect due to higher than expected temperatures. And we're doing a number of things to help British Columbians get through this heat wave safely. Over the past week, Emergency Management BC has been working with local communities and First Nations to ensure they have the support that they need. This includes reimbursements for cooling centres that have targeted support for vulnerable British Columbians, transportation to and from cooling centres in communities where no scheduled public or reasonable transportation exists, staff wages and overtime to compensate for the opening of civic facilities that would otherwise not be open, and water for distribution within those facilities. Also in the interest of public safety and in order to reach a broader range of British Columbians, government is working with TV and radio stations to provide critical info during this second heat wave. In addition, we will continue posting social media updates to get out much needed information on how to find local supports. The province's Emergency Info BC website, which can be found at emergencyinfobc.ca, is a one-stop shop for information on wildfire evacuee supports as well as information on heat wave supports, how to prepare, and info on heat-related illnesses and cooling centre locations. People who are evacuated from their homes due to the wildfires are particularly vulnerable during this time, and local governments are being encouraged to let evacuees know about cooling centre locations in their area. So people should plan ahead Find out how you can spend time in a cool or air-conditioned place. While heat can harm anyone, older adults and, younger chi and children younger than five years old are particularly vulnerable to the effects of a heat wave. So I encourage all British Columbians to check with one another, especially on those people you know are living alone. Be sure to use the supports available and to take extra care of any vulnerable people and their family, friends and pets this weekend. I also want to thank local governments and healthcare workers for mobilizing to help British Columbians stay cool and safe through this heat wave. The heat wave is a stark reminder of the impacts of climate change and the need to prepare for hotter weather and more frequent heat events as people and as government and as a health system. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister Farnworth. And uh, as uh, all of you know, Environment Canada heat warnings are in effect for most of the province. Uh, the very high temperatures are expected to continue for the next 48 hours at least. And that this is happening, of course, at a time when many people in the province are experiencing very poor air quality from wildfires. That will affect an increasing number of people in the province this weekend. Extreme heat is dangerous. It takes a toll on people's health. It's especially risky for people who are vulnerable, like seniors and people dealing with chronic health conditions. When temperatures go up, it's time for all of us to step up to help keep people safe and to help keep people cool, to help protect ourselves and our loved ones. The province is mobilized to help people during this heat uh, alert across the healthcare system and across other government ministries, as Minister Farnworth has said. Working together with our health authorities and local government partners, we're re ready to help people and communities beat the heat and this work is already underway. All of our health authorities are, have all their systems on, on emergency footing to help anyone who might experience heat or smoke-related challenges. In acute care, emergency rooms are being, re, staff are being redeployed to emergency rooms to meet demand, and steps are in place to keep people in hospitals cool and safe. In long-term care, residents and their families will see staff taking proactive steps to keep, people, uh, the, to keep everyone hydrated and cool. In home care, caregivers will be checking in with you, to meet with, with everyone, to make sure that they're okay, and if they need help, they'll get the help that they need. In all of these sectors of the healthcare people, the people that we connect with regularly, we are mobilized, as we have been in the past, to assist. I want to add, with respect to emergency health services, that if you or a loved one experiences heat-related illness and you need help, please call 911. The BC Ambulance Service is ready to serve you. The new Chief Ambulance Officer is taking steps to ensure people who, uh, ensure people who call for help get help and get help quickly. 
working with paramedics and dispatchers in every case. Provincial and emergency operations centers are now in operations in BC EHS. More clinicians are working this weekend to help the dispatchers responding to your calls to make sure the response you get is the best response. Managers have stepped up to work at hospital ERs to make sure people who need immediate medical attention get out of ambulances and into care as quickly as possible. The Chief Ambulance Officer is also taking steps to make sure paramedics are well supported. They will take care of people who take care of us with water, Gatorade and permission to wear clothing that's made for summer, not a BC winter. In addition, the province is getting a big assist from the ambulance paramedics of BC, QP, QP Local 873. They have been instrumental to the province's work to renew the ambulance service and they are going above and beyond this weekend to make sure that when people call for help they get a response and get a response quickly. Thanks to them we are bolstering BC's emergency response capabilities this weekend. This includes the activation of on-call rural shifts to full time for the weekend periods. Pre-scheduling overtime with a pick a partner, pick a time approach. Flexibility with pairing and using EMR staff in the Lower Mainland from other areas by teaming them up with other paramedics. Uh, tra transfer calls for 911, low acuity, staffed with EMRs. Alternate transportation being made available and redeploying community paramedics in some parts of the province to higher demand areas. And also additional manager support to respond to 911 calls. In addition, our teams at HealthLink BC who have done uh, exceptional work throughout the pandemic in British Columbia and who received dramatically more calls every day are prepared to take more calls this weekend. If you need help from HealthLink uh, BC, call 811. Our approach to this weekend's expected heat is really a community effort. We have all hands on deck to be there. We are truly all hands on deck to be there when you need help. And you can join in this effort by taking caution and reaching out to people in your circles to remind them to keep cool and seek clean air, to talk to those people in your circles, your friends, your family, who are vulnerable, who may be el our elders or have chronic diseases, who need our help and support. Don't worry about being a bother. Contact people and engage with them. The heat sometimes has an effect on all of us, which we do not immediately recognize ourselves. So let's support one another this weekend. Follow the outstanding advice from the BC CDC on the health authority websites and on other sources of information to take the steps you need to take to stay cool as well. And with that in mind, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Uh, Dr. Henderson. She's the scientific director of environmental health at the BC Center for Disease Control. She's an environmental epidemiologist and she's been studying the health effects of wildfire smoke and extreme hot weather for over 20 years. And she's here to talk to, talk to everyone in BC about steps that they can take, about the impact of smoke, the impact of heat, and what steps they can take to stay safer. Dr. Henderson. Thank you very much, Minister Dix, and good afternoon, everybody. I want to start by reiterating something that Minister Dix has just said. Um, along with my colleague, Dr. Kazatsi, I've been studying the health effects of extreme hot weather for many, many years. And we know from the global literature and from heat waves that have occurred elsewhere that one of the most dangerous things during a heat wave is social isolation. When it gets hot, be it this weekend, be it later this summer, be it next year, one of the best things you can do is check in with the folks who you know may be isolated, especially those who have chronic conditions, physical or mental health chronic conditions, and those who are living alone. As Mr. Minister Dick said, people may not always perceive that they are getting too hot when we have passive indoor heat, it can be, come dangerously overwhelming without people even realizing it. So ask questions. Ask what it says on the thermostat. Ask when they last drank water. Ask what color their urine is. Dark or uh, small amount of urine is an indicator of potentially dangerous um, dehydration. After that key message, 
I want to talk about preparing for the heat and things that you can do in the heat. So preparing is paying attention to what Environment Canada is saying, the information that's available on these websites, thinking about uh, how you're going to cover your windows to keep the sun out, which blinds to use at which time of the day to keep that solar radiation out of the house and to keep it from cooling or from warming the house up. Have a fan handy if you are able to have a fan handy. And then think about how to keep hot temperatures out of your house. So one of the key messages is that once it gets hotter outside than it is indoors, you should be shutting your windows, pulling those blinds and trapping the cooler air that's indoors inside until the temperatures get lower again overnight and then open everything up again to let that cooler air back in. When it gets hot, make sure that you're drinking plenty of water and that people around you are drinking plenty of water. Often, just drink more water than you think you need. Cool yourself down, either by staying in air-conditioned spaces if you can, in cooling centers that are in the community, or applying water to your body. A wet towel over top of you can really help with that evapotranspiration and make you feel cool the way sweat makes you feel cool. Know the symptoms of dangerous heat exhaustion and heat stroke. If you find that people are getting confused, dizzy, fainting, you need to call because that can turn into an emergency very quickly. After you call, get the person cooled down. Tub of cold water, wet towels all over them, whatever you can do to help cool the body down will help to protect that person. I want to switch now a little bit to wildfire smoke. It's been very smoky throughout the central interior of the province through the past several weeks. The forecast is showing that we are going to have a change in weather systems and that that change may start bringing smoke to other parts of the province as well. So not only is it going to be hot, it may also be quite smoky. This is a particular risk for anybody who has a pre-existing respiratory condition such as asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It's also a risk for anybody whose health may be compromised on a day-to-day -day basis. That smoke causes irritation and it ca can cause inflammation that affects the entire body. The best way to protect yourself from wildfire smoke is to try to minimize your exposure. That means running a portable air cleaner in your house if you can, or making a do-it-yourself air cleaner out of a box fan and an air filter. Anything to take those small particles in the smoke out of the indoor air. It may mean wearing something like an N95 or a KN95 respirator when you're outdoors. More importantly, take it easy when you're outdoors. If you're really exerting yourself, you may be breathing 10 times more air than when you're resting. That means that you're 10 times more exposed to the wildfire smoke. So everybody needs to be careful with these two environmental conditions that may come together over the weekend. And as Minister Dick said, we really all need to look out for each other and need to ensure that we're checking in with those people who are at most at risk from these exposures. Thank you very much. Back to Minister Dix. Thank you, and I think we're now taking questions. As a reminder to media on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. Please also remember to take your phone off mute. You will not be audible until your name is called. Our first question today is from Binder Sajan, CTV. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Minister. Um, I heard there the, the different um, protocols going to place this weekend with regards to uh, paramedics and um, getting, you know, emergency services for people. But do you believe that there will be enough um, paramedics on the ground this weekend to make sure that people aren't waiting hours and hours for um, for relief like they were the last time around? 
Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, our team at uh, BC Emergency Health Services, uh, led by our Chief Ambulance Officer, Leanne Heppel, who, as you know, has been in place for a couple of weeks, and our uh, new Chair of the Board, Jim Chu, I think have done some really exceptional things. The list of measures I talked about to get more people in the field, to get more supports for them, to improve the time around transfers when people go to emergency rooms, we'll be using as well our urgent and primary care centers around the province. All of those will help us, I think, will increase the number of calls we can get to and provide a more rapid response. And I want to express uh, my appreciation because we've been working very closely with the ambulance paramedics of BC, QP Local 873, to make sure that we have adequate staff, supported staff in the field. In addition to that, we're taking steps to support uh, our staff uh, across the province uh, by, by providing uh, uh, drinks by providing alternative opportunities where alternative clothing all the kinds of things we have to do uh, this weekend to support our ambulance paramedics so uh, what I'm saying is that people um, if they need to call 911 should call 911 if they need to call 811 they should call 811 that we have uh, more resources in both places available as you also know Binder, there's been a significant increase over the period now of, uh, of months really uh, since um, since really we, we began to see uh, the end of the third wave of COVID-19. I, I think uh, I heard 30 of the 32 um, highest days of ambulance calls in history have been in the last period, which means we're seeing a fundamental change in resources. Um, we've uh, we posted a very significant number of, uh, of positions uh, at the beginning of June, full-time positions. So we're transferring people to full-time positions to stabilize the service. And the 85 uh, paramedics I announced uh, a couple of weeks ago, 30 dispatchers, those positions will be posted at 3 o'clock this afternoon. So we're also taking steps not just for this weekend and all the work that's gone into it from QP Local 873 and from uh, our team at uh, BC Emergency Health Services for this weekend, the, the, the plan is in place to continue to improve and meet this extraordinary demand for ambulance services in the months to come. Binder, did you have a follow-up? Yes, please. And Minister, I heard you reference the end of the third wave there. The federal government uh, today releasing modeling that says we could be on the cusp of a fourth wave. And also we know that very soon someone who tests positive for COVID-19 in Alberta uh, won't have to isolate. So I'm just wondered, wondering, how worried are you about that leading to Albertans coming to BC while positive? And do you think BC could soon follow in that direction? Well, um, we have no plans, none to change our requirements around self-isolation in BC. We have no plans, none, to change our approach to contact tracing in BC. That the public health part of the response will have to con will continue to be um, uh, substantial and uh, meet the necessary needs of people who get sick with COVID-19, who not just don't need advice, and they need, we need to obviously contract trace and work with the, the broader community of people around them, and also help them uh, during what can be a very stressful, and of course, uh, for many people, a period when people get extremely sick. So all of those things are the steps we're continuing to take, the public health steps continue. We, as you know, our, we've eased restrictions over the last um, period. We're in step three right now of our, uh, our plan, our reopening plan. And step four is planned to be for the beginning part of September. And we will again need to meet um, the test of step four with respect to hospitalizations, with respect to mortality, with respect to cases, and, uh, and immunization at that time. So right now we're at step three, and there's no plans to change from that. We're still on course to move to step four. And of course, the third part of that, and the public health measures which have to continue and become even more important, I'd argue, in this time, the, uh, the issue around restrictions and how we act as communities and the steps we've taken locally, for example, in central Okanagan. And the final thing is immunization. Uh, as of today, 81.1% of British Columbians have been immunized with one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. And, the, and in terms of second doses, it's 64.9% of all those over 12, all those eligible to receive doses. And that number continues to grow uh, quickly uh, day unto day. And so the number of people who are partially vaccinated will get smaller and smaller in the weeks to come. And, but the key, and I say this, is 
that uh, immunization is our critical response. There are opportunities for everyone. This weekend, although it's a difficult weekend for many people because of uh, the heat, a difficult weekend because of the smoke, a difficult weekend in many ways, and it's a long weekend, of course, in BC, there are opportunities this weekend to get immunized and on Tuesday, and then on walk-in Wednesday when there will be very significant opportunities to be immunized everywhere in BC, 20,000 extra doses going out so that everyone across BC can walk in. We have to raise immunization rates. We've had the, one of the best immunization vaccination programs in the world here in BC. It has been remarkable, but we have to do better. If you look at the numbers, uh, Binder, you'll see that uh, that it's that above 50, there's very little difference between the health authorities, between Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health, and Interior Health and Northern Health and Vancouver Island Health. Under 50, there's a significant difference between the number of people immunized in Vancouver Coastal, Fraser, and Vancouver, Vancouver Island Health than in Interior Health. So we need to raise immunization rates for people under 50 in the Interior Health Authority, and there is opportunities to do that, including special pop-up clinics that have been established in Kelowna, for example, in the last few days and across Interior Health. So immunization is key to that. That's why we have our Vax for BC campaign, and we ask everyone to get immunized. It is more important than ever for us to continue to push that number up. We don't want to be the best in the world. We want to be as high in terms of immunization rate as we can go. Our next question is from Lisa Yuzda, News 1130. Please go ahead. Hello, ministers. Following up a bit on what Binder was asking there, with this regional approach that the province is taking in response to COVID, and looking at how the ferries are packed up for the whole weekend, is there a risk, and looking just there was 41 cases yesterday on the island, which is high for here, is the COVID party from Kelowna just being sent elsewhere in the province with this kind of regional approach? Well, uh, I would say that COVID-19 uh, exists all over BC, and the, and the threat of transmission of uh, COVID-19 exists everywhere in BC. And uh, I'm sure when the numbers are announced shortly today, you'll see cases uh, in, every, uh, in every health authority in BC. And what that means is that in every health authority in BC, every health authority in BC, uh, that, um, that uh, we need more people to get vaccinated. So even in Vancouver Coastal Health, where that number is, um, is uh, north of 85% now, over 12, um, there's something that's better than 86%, and that's 87%, 88%, and 89%. That vaccination is the key. And there are opportunities right now, this week, weekend, this next week, the week after that, to get vaccinated for everybody who wants to get vaccinated in BC, and we have to make that case. People have to continue to be cautious. We're at step three in our reopening, not at step four, we're at step three. And we are gonna to continue to support and help people who get sick with COVID-19 everywhere in BC. What we see, what we continue to see, is, uh, is that overwhelmingly our cases, our new cases of COVID-19 are amongst unimmunized people and we have to assist them uh, in uh, getting immunized to the maximum possible degree. And of course, when people get sick, assist them as well. Those are important things. There's a lot of um, desire, I know, to take an us versus them approach, but this is only us, all of us together in BC. We have to work together at this stage in the pandemic as we have throughout to deal with the consequences of COVID-19. So uh, I, think, I think that with respect to restrictions, we're in a good space that people need to be respectful of other people. Recall, uh, remember that there is, it is recommended in indoor public spaces to wear masks everywhere in BC. It's mandatory, of course, in the central Okanagan local health area. But I, I think we all have to work in our own communities, in our own areas. This isn't about um, uh, people uh, in uh, the central Okanagan, this thing that that issues come from elsewhere because as you know in the central Okanagan overall there have been lower rates of COVID-19 through most of the pandemic or people from other regions talking about a party moving there. It's our responsibility everywhere to take steps and uh, and I would expect that we'll do that. Lisa did you have a follow-up? Looking at this push for vaccinations and, and saying that vaccinations are key and looking at the changes in Alberta, you know, that people are not going to have to isolate as of the 16th. 
in by the 31st, they're only testing in high-risk situations, and they're not doing contact tracing anymore starting mid-month. Is this really a message to people that if you can't be bothered to get vaccinated, we're kind of done protecting you? Like, is it a real shift in philosophy that we've done as much as we can as a government, as public health, and now it's up to you to get the shot? Well, uh, remember, Lisa, we're talking about Alberta, not British Columbia in that case. And I I don't want to caricature what they're doing uh, uh, there as well. They have outstanding public health leadership in Alberta, and I'm very respectful of the work of healthcare workers and of public health leadership and in Alberta in dealing with the pandemic. And in fact, governments across Canada, um, and we're proud because I think Dr. Uh, Henry has taken a leadership role in the country, but I think governments across Canada have taken on balance quite similar approaches to dealing with the pandemic uh, to this point. Well, let's be clear, there's three sorts of things we need to do. We need to raise vaccination levels, and we are. We need to answer questions. Last night and the night before, uh, Dr. Henry and I did four telephone town hall meetings answering questions of many people who are still uh, have questions about vaccination in BC. And so we took that opportunity to do that, and we're going to continue to do that in the next weeks to provide more opportunities in communities where perhaps or smaller communities where an all of community approach. Um, means that we've only been there once or twice or three or four times. We need to go back and give people new opportunities to get immunized. So it's immunization and then it's public health action. And that's continuing. There is no plan, none, to change our uh, approach to self-isolation. When you get sick with COVID-19 in BC, no plans, none, to change our approach to contact tracing. No plans, uh, none, for public health not to be fully engaged as they've been in the COVID-19 pandemic. What's changed? The thing that's changed is that we've moved away and we'll move away from province-wide measures to more precise restrictions. And that's the third aspect of where we are. So there's none of that uh, here. I don't, I don't think that's a fair description of what they're doing in Alberta, uh, in fairness to them. But I can tell you, here in British Columbia, we remain determined to help people with COVID-19. And, to, and I want to say this, no one, no one needs to take an approach of blame here. We need to work and encourage and support communities everywhere, and that's what we're going to continue to do. Our next question is from Camille Baines, CP. Please go ahead. Hi there. Uh, I'm not sure who wants to take this question, maybe Minister Dix, but there have been suggestions that more resources are needed for uh, older people, especially those who are not that mobile and can't get into cooling centres, that buildings... For example, in the West End, where a lot of older people live, live should be identified and uh, people, help should be going to them instead of they being expected to be going somewhere else to a cooling centre. Is that something that you would consider doing? I think that's something that's happening in lots of places. I know um, that's happening in, in my neighbourhood. Collingwood Neighbourhood House is doing just that. They have uh, a bus, a seniors bus that they are using to... Um, uh, provide people access to the cooling center at the neighborhood house. That's an example of that. So, yes, I think um, one of the, um, it's not a lesson, one of the lessons I think of all heat waves, um, and uh, in particular the last one, is that, uh, yes, people who are most ill are most vulnerable are at risk, but th those are the people frequently that the healthcare system is working with already. So in long-term care, in uh, assisted living, Get receiving home support, receiving uh, community health services of some kind. But a lot of the people who are most affected are those uh, working or uh, living in isolation. And as Dr. Henderson has suggested, that th that their, their risk is not just underlying health conditions, but it's a risk of underlying health conditions and social isolation. And that's why we're asking people to get engaged, and community organizations are getting engaged with people who are in those circumstances and where possible. Absolutely, we need to uh, encourage people to reach out and provide the, uh, the opportunity to go to cooling centers. You're quite right that for many people who ha might have mobility issues, getting to a cooling center can be a challenge. And that's why uh, we provide the advice Dr. Henry has provided, but also uh, in many communities, other support. So um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a positive idea. And I think, uh, uh, I don't know uh, uh, oh, okay. uh, if Minister, Minister Farmer or Dr. Henderson, you have anything to add to that? Oh. Okay. Camille, did you have a follow-up? 
Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering if there's a way that the province can track heat-related illness, either by uh, issuing certain billing codes for that type of uh, illness, or how could we actually track it to know what the problem is and then have a proper response going forward? Well, I, I think, and I'll, I think uh, this one I will ask Dr. Henderson to comment on. I mean, what we're going through right now with respect to the what's called the heat dome, which was the most significant uh, heat event in the recent history of the province, let's say. And the most comparable one was from 2009, and really it was nothing like it. And that, but the, in the time between 2009 to 2021, there wasn't an equivalent one, and it tells us about the changes that are happening uh, in our society. So there's a case-by-case -case examination, really a comprehensive examination of that going on by the coroner. That, of course, focuses on those people who passed away in that time, and, and obviously we have um, and we are, are able to follow through and, and study the impact on those who've had the most severe outcome one can have but we, uh, and passing away. And that review will assist us, I think, in our overall response and how we make uh, uh, changes in the future. But uh, we, do, we do analyze, as you've seen through COVID-19, um, data around uh, illness as well that's uh, significant, and that can include the, the data we've provided through BCEHS in terms of the number of heat-related calls and so on. And uh, I'll ask Dr. Henderson to follow up on the details of that because she does this all the time. Yes, thank you for the question. There are many different data sources that we can use to evaluate the impacts of these hot weather events, and I would say that the data do exist. As Minister Dix said, you know, we know that some people call the ambulance service uh, because of extreme hot weather, but we also know that calls go up for unconsciousness and fainting, uh, so they don't have that extreme hot weather code. We can see in the ER visit data that there was a number of increases in, in ER visits for complaints due to extreme hot weather. So the data exist, now it's time to use them to the best of their ability and to harness them. You know, we've really seen the power of displaying data through the COVID-19 pandemic with the provincial COVID dashboard and that's kind of how we have to be thinking so that we can keep a really close eye on these events as they occur. The next question is from Colton Davis, Radio NL. Please go ahead. Hi there. A uh, question is for Minister Farnworth. Uh, you mentioned off the top reimbursements uh, for communities that open cooling centres. I'm just curious, uh, would that reimbursement be retroactive to the previous heat wave or uh, previous heat waves in our case in the interior? Um, I'm just asking, uh, I know locally in Kamloops, the cooling centre was open for more than two weeks from late June uh, and early July, and then it opened again for another heat wave we had. Um, and also another part of that question is we've had a civic building used in Kamloops for refuge from wildfire smoke for two full weeks now, and it's staying open until further notice. Uh, would a smoke relief center be reimbursed as well, or would this just include cooling centers at this point? Um, it is for uh, cooling centers. In fact, the, uh, the, the financial relief was in the, place. The financial uh, relief was in place uh, during the last uh, uh, heat event. Uh, so that would be covered, and that was communicated to uh, to local to local governments, uh, and certainly uh, in the case of a smoke a smoke, uh, a smoke uh, a facility, a civic facility that's kept open, uh, again that would also be covered. No, that's good for right now. Thank you. Our next question today is from Rob Buffum, CTV. Please go ahead. Oh, uh, my question is for Minister Dix. I'm just, I'm wondering about your thoughts. You've been asked questions related to this earlier, but I'm wondering, given that folks are, we're hearing that some folks who would have been going to the Okanagan are now coming to Vancouver Island, all the hotels here are booked this weekend in Victoria. Are you concerned uh, with folks from elsewhere in BC coming here as well as a burden that we're going to see an increase, a spike in COVID cases on the island? And when it's, you know, the numbers are announced on Tuesday, we will see a significant increase in island health. Um, first of all, I'd say uh, about numbers being announced. Remember, 
uh, and this is important when we reflect on example, numbers. We're seeing cases that um, the measures we talked about were taken uh, as of Wednesday night at midnight, and it's going to take some time for those uh, those uh, changes to have an effect on new cases. So we uh, we may or may not see anything anywhere on Tuesday morning. In any event, it won't be because of uh, travel on the weekend. So that's just the the nature of uh, COVID-19 case data. I think uh, on Vancouver Island we are in a good place. We have high levels of immunization uh, on Vancouver Island, but there are opportunities, for example, in Langford uh, tonight at the soccer game uh, to get immunized. And I think it's important that we continue to increase levels of immunization on Vancouver Island, just to put those in context. And, and that, that's why it's important for the safety of people on Vancouver Island, because there are always people, as you know, coming to Vancouver Island that right now immunization rates, uh, first dose immunization rates are at 82.4 percent on Vancouver Island, so above the provincial average, but they can always be higher. And so what I'm encouraging people to do is take the multiple opportunities they have to get immunized this weekend on Vancouver Island, either if they're eligible for dose two or for dose one, that we remember that we're still at step three and that we, can, got to, we must continue to respect and work with one another. But I don't, I don't necessarily expect I, I, it's my understanding that there are, we're a, there's a lot of traffic everywhere in the province, including, as you would expect, long weekend traffic to Vancouver Island, and that I don't think we're seeing right now um, much traffic displaced to Vancouver Island at, at this time. But that doesn't mean that uh, COVID-19 isn't everywhere in BC. We've had cases in the last few days on Vancouver Island. We're going to continue to have some cases on Vancouver Island. And that means it's as important on Vancouver Island as anywhere to get immunized against COVID-19. And I encourage people to take the multiple opportunities they're going to have this weekend and next week and on walk up Wednesday, in particular August 4th, to get immunized. That's one of the ways all of us can keep Vancouver Island uh, safer during this pandemic. Rob, did you have a follow-up? I do. Earlier this week, um, we got a breakdown of people who are vaccinated versus those who are unvaccinated in terms of overall case counts for uh, you know, the month of June 15th through July 15th. I guess I'm just wondering, going forward, um, is it being considered or might, be, might it be possible to get a breakdown when we get the case count of how many of those people are unvaccinated? And might that be a useful way to illustrate the, the importance of it? Well, I, uh, Rob, we're going to continue to provide that information. It doesn't come in, in quite in that way. So, uh, provide the case counts day to day. And, uh, and so the reason we were providing information from June 15th to July 15th is it will take us some days to get that information and we'll continue to update it. But I, I think what you're going to see, the only change you're going to see really fundamentally from what we saw, what Dr. Henry presented uh, on Tuesday, is a significant reduction in those partially vaccinated as we uh, increase quite rapidly the number of people who are receiving their second doses today, it's basically 65% over 12. And the number of people who receive first doses is over 81 or 81.1%. You see that the number of people uh, who have only received one dose is down to one in every six people. It was much higher on June 15th when that previous information was provided. So what we're going to see, I think, is pretty much the same thing in the coming months, and we will be providing that information. It does make the case as you suggest, about the value of vaccination and keeping people healthy. I just want to say to everybody, it's a nasty, vicious virus. It's vicious. It can affect you. Some people don't get affected that much and recover quickly. Some people, whatever their age, are affected for a long period of time. And so it's not just an issue of hospitalization or mortality. It's an issue of its effect on your health. And that is a profound, strong reason to get vaccinated among the dozens of strong reasons to get vaccinated right now. And that's all the questions we have for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a safe weekend.